action, however, Hanstein and Murray are very clear about that being unfair. And I quote, To what extent is a society fair when people of similar ability and background are treated as differently as they are now? In 1964, the answer was ridiculous. Such a society is manifestly unfair. The logic was right then, and right now. So colleges are missing applicants for non-academic reasons, such as their father having gone there, that's okay. It's counteracting the dreaded cognitive partitioning of society after all. But colleges are missing applicants because of affirmative action. Well, that is, rather dramatically, leaking a poison into the American soul. So how do we account for this apparent contradiction on the part of Anthony and Murray? Well, what would you imagine to be the most likely difference between a legacy of Harvard applicant and an affirmative action applicant? I will leave it to you to ponder that. Instead of the unfair and poisonous racial affirmative action, Hanstein and Murray argue instead for a race-aligned version of affirmative action based, bizarrely, on test scores. And I say bizarrely here because this idea would actually accelerate the supposedly apocalyptic cognitive partitioning. They say that in the case of two candidates who are fairly closely matched otherwise, universities should give the nod to the applicant from the disadvantaged background. Now I agree with this in isolation here. I do think that if you have two similar candidates, you should have been the less privileged one. But with regards to Hernstein and Murray's figures of cognitive partitioning though, this is exactly what they were worried about. Colleges becoming better at collecting all of society's high IQ people together and funneling them into high IQ jobs in high IQ areas. They basically said, here's an apocalyptic problem, and now here's how to make it happen faster. And actually, regarding the concept of affirmative action, their logic is all wrong there. At the start of the chapter titled Affirmative Action in Higher Education, Hernstein and Murray recount an affirmative action controversy from 1991, where a law student at Georgetown University, quote, surreptitiously compiled the entrance statistics for a sample of applicants to Georgetown's law school and then published the results of his research in the law school student newspaper. He revealed that the mean on the law school aptitude test differed by a large margin for accepted black and white students. Hanstein and Murray dubbed this difference the ethnic premium or edge that minority applicants are supposed to be afforded in the admissions process, and go on to detail how they've looked at the college admissions data from 26 colleges and found that in the classes entering those in 1991 and 92, the average SAT scores for the black students were below the average SAT scores of the white students. Hernstein and Murray produced proof that black students have an unfair edge in the college admissions process. Quote, the summary statement about affirmative action in undergraduate institutions is that being either a black or a Latino is worth a great deal in the admissions process at every undergraduate school for which we have data. However, this method of measuring the supposed results of affirmative action is entirely incorrect. There is a crucial flaw in the logic here, and it begins with Hanstein and Murray's decision to begin their analysis by looking at the college entrance data instead of earlier by thinking about the wider pool of college applicants. So black people have historically had lower SAT scores than white people. Now whether you believe this is due to some fixed genetically originated lower IQ, or you're sensible and you believe it's down to environmental reasons, it is the case. So in any random group of students applying to a college in the United States, we would expect the scores of the black students to be, on average, lower than the white students if you follow. So what happens next is the college takes a look at this group of applicants and decides to admit some of them using certain criteria. So test scores, but usually various other things like extracurricular activities and whatever else. So all the accepted students get in and all the denied students go off to apply somewhere else, right? Then Hernstein and Murray come along from the college and they notice that the scores of the black students are on average below the white students and thus start applying the terrible unfairness of affirmative action. But what they've missed here is that this discrepancy between the average black and white scores would still exist even if the college admissions process only considered test scores and nothing else. 
And let's think about this. Imagine an American college in 1991 with a certain amount of positions to fill and they get a larger group of students applying for those positions, right? So they have to let some in and not others. In that group of applicants, there will be a range of test scores and the black applicants will have, on average, lower scores than the white applicants. And let's say this college only admits people via test scores, so if they have 1,000 positions to fill, they only accept the top 1,000 SAT scores and they send everyone else packing. Now in this group of 1,000 successful applicants, there will still be both black and white people, but of those black people who scored high enough to get in, they will be on average towards the lower end of the range, meaning the black group average will still be lower than the white group average, even though they all scored high enough to get in. Even in a world without affirmative action, and even with a totally racially blind admissions policy, and accepting Hans and Murray's positions regarding racial IQ scores, a disparity between black and white fat scores in college intake groups would still exist. The only way we can fairly expect the two averages to be the same is if the black and white students in that 1991 applicant group also had, on average, the same scores. And since Hans, Dean, and Murray have just spent a huge section of their book arguing for black people's lower cognitive ability, I don't know why they'd be expecting that. Moving on from affirmative action, I'd like to ask a question. Can the politics of the bell curve be described as eugenics? And I mean, yes, right? They're arguing for policies with the agenda of changing birth rates for particular groups of people. They want lower IQ mothers to have fewer children. Pernstein and Murray stop short of openly embracing eugenics, however. They pull a rhetorical trick by saying they're simply worried about dysgenics. Dysgenics being the opposite of eugenics there, so we're not necessarily for it, but we are anti the opposite of it. That's very clever. One telling quote here is when Hernstein and Murray, talking about the Nazis, say the following followed by the terrors of Nazism and its perversion of eugenics that effectively wiped the idea from public discourse in the West. Now the phrase perversion of eugenics should set off some alarm bells there, implying apparently that there is a good sort of eugenics and the Nazis just did it wrong or took it too far or something. Or maybe there was just something uniquely evil about Nazi eugenics that wasn't present in the supposedly good eugenics. Is that true? Well, let's find out. The footage you're seeing here is from a movie called Earth Crank. In English, the Hereditary Defector. This is a 1936 propaganda film produced by the Nazi Party's Racial Policy Office. It features video shots at German psychiatric hospitals of people with various types of disabilities, interspersed with text informing the audience, among other things, of the expense of caring for these people going on to argue that the prevention of hereditarily sick offspring is a moral duty. Now, I'm not actually showing the images of the people in the video here, as they almost certainly did not consent to be in a film which was used to propagandize in favor of their sterilization, and I would feel uncomfortable including that footage in my video. Herb Crank is available online, so if you prefer to watch it. The film ends with the quote, The farmer who prevents the overgrowth of the weed promotes the valuable. The purpose of this film was obviously to increase public support for the involuntary sterilization of people with disabilities, a Nazi program that would escalate into outright mass murder just a few years later. Adolf Hitler was reportedly a fan of Erb Crank and encouraged the production of a sequel titled Victims of the Past, The Sin Against Blood and Race, which was shown in cinemas throughout Nazi Germany in 1937. So why am I talking about Herb Crank here? Is this simply a slippery slope argument, perhaps? Look where all this eugenics rubbish leads to the Nazis and the Holocaust. Uh, now, although I think that would be a fair point to make, actually, uh, no, this particular movie has a much more direct link to what we're talking about today. Now, something that might come as a shock to you, and it certainly did to me in the process of researching this video, is the extent of the international eugenics movement prior to World War II. Nazi eugenicists were not operating in the book, and most importantly for us here is that they had a reciprocal relationship with American eugenicists. See, Herb Frank had another big fan, in addition to Hitler. 
So this guy is Harry H. Locke, an American eugenicist, director of the Eugenics Record Office and founding member of the American Eugenics Society. He liked eugenics. He didn't pick up on that. Now, in 1922, Harry Laughlin published a book titled Eugenical Sterilization in the United States, which included a chapter titled Model Eugenical Sterilization Law. This model law begins an act to prevent the procreation of persons socially inadequate from defective inheritance by authorizing and providing for the eugenical sterilization of certain potential parents carrying degenerate hereditary qualities. This law designates a socially inadequate person as someone who fails chronically in comparison with normal persons to maintain himself or herself as a useful member of the organized social life of the state. These socially inadequate people were not just the ill, but also, for example, the criminalistic, the inebriate, and the dependent, including orphans, ne'er-do-wells, the homeless, tramps, and paupers. 18 US states passed laws based upon Laughlin's model, and between them sterilized tens of thousands of people. And in 1933, Somewhere else passed a law which was based upon Lockland's model, the Law for the Prevention of Hereditarily Diseased Offspring, which actually was slightly more moderate than what the model law proposed, if you can believe it. This was, of course, Nazi Germany. Lockland was later awarded an honorary degree by the University of Heidelberg for his work on behalf of the quote, science of racial cleansing. Laughlin was also an open Nazi party supporter, writing enthusiastically about Nazi Germany's eugenics laws in a publication titled Eugenic News. And why shouldn't he be excited about them? I mean, he wrote them. In addition to inspiring Nazi party policy, Laughlin also helped to disseminate their propaganda. In 1936, he purchased an English translation of Herb Frank and raised funds to have been shown in American high school, which it won. That's right, just a couple of years before the Nazis started systematically murdering people with disabilities, this Nazi eugenics movie was actually shown in American schools, and this event was reported on favorably in the Nazi press. Laughlin raised the funds to distribute the film by writing to Wycliffe Draper, who was another American eugenicist and racist and, importantly for Laughlin, a millionaire. Together in 1937, Laughlin and Draper founded the Pioneer Fund, the purpose of which was to promote a genetic stock of people, quote, deemed to be descended predominantly from white persons who settled in the original 13 states prior to the adoption of the Constitution. Now, besides subjecting school children to Nazi propaganda, the Pioneer Fund set about supporting massive air quotes, research into race betterment, giving enormous grants to any researcher willing to push a pro-eugenics agenda. And here, dear video watchers, is where we rejoin the bell curve. Richard Lynn, you remember, the guy who thinks the single best study of the quote, Negroid intelligence was carried out under apartheid, He's received over $600,000 from the Pioneer Fund and currently, as in now, currently today, is the head of the Pioneer Fund because it is still going and he is still alive. Mankind Quarterly, the journal which published Lynn's work that is cited in the bell curve, is funded by the Pioneer Fund. Mankind Quarterly includes among its founders Henry Garrett, an American psychologist who testified in favor of segregated schools during Brown vs. Board of Education, Corrado Gini, who was president of the Italian Genetics and Eugenics Society in Fascist Italy, and Otmar Freiherr von Verschuer, who was director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Heredity and Eugenics in Nazi Germany, was a member of the Nazi Party, and, believe it or not, the mentor of Joseph Mengele. Joseph Mengele, of course, being the physician at the Auschwitz concentration camp, infamous for performing human experimentation on the prisoners. During World War II, Mengele provided Bashua with human remains from Auschwitz to use in his research into eugenics. That is who founded Mankind Quarterly. Editor of the New Republic, Charles Lane, writing about the bell curve in 1994, noted that five articles from the journal, that's Mankind Quarterly, 
are actually cited in the Belshev's bibliography, but the influence on the book from scholars linked to Mankind Wars Lee is more significant. No fewer than 17 researchers cited in the bibliography of the Belshev have contributed to Mankind Wars Lee. Ten are present or former editors, or members of its editorial advisory board. J. Philippe Rushton, the guy wandering around asking people how far they can ejaculate, he was president of the Pioneer Fund from 2002 to 2012, received hundreds of thousands of dollars from it, and he used Pioneer Funds to mail 40,000 copies of his book Race, Evolution and Behavior to various social scientists. Another Pioneer Fund recipient was American anthropologist Donald Swan. Now in 1966, Donald Swan was arrested on charges of mail fraud. When the police investigated Swan's apartment, they found an assortment of illegal weapons, a stash of racist literature, Nazi memorabilia including flags and a helmet, and photographs of Swan with members of the American Nazi party. Oops. Do you remember Linda Gottfriedson, the author of the public statement defending the Belcare's claims about intelligence that I mentioned way back at the start of the video? Well, as of 1994, she'd received $267,000 from the Pioneer Fund. And speaking of that public statement, actually, the Southern Poverty Law Center notes that more than 20 of the 52 signatories were themselves Pioneer Fund recipients. And crucially for us here, the Pioneer Fund wanted to fund Richard Ernesty. The head of the fund prior to Jason Lee Rushton was a lawyer called Harry Ed Weyer. And in 1994, the year that the Belcare came out, he told a journalist interviewing him that regarding Ernesty, we have funded him at the drop of a hat, or he never had. Now the fact that the bell curve includes among its sources a bunch of people who received money from the Nazi fund and publish papers in the Nazi journal was understandably cause for concern for many when it was published, and this was used frequently to dismiss the arguments. So Murray includes a very short defense of the Pioneer Fund in his afterwards to the bell curve, which reads the following. The relationship between the founder of the Pioneer Fund and today's Pioneer Fund is roughly analogous to that between Henry Ford and today's Ford Foundation. So he's saying, you know, it may have been founded by pro-Nazi eugenicists, but today it's completely different. The trouble is, Murray includes absolutely no evidence to back this statement up. He treats it as a given. But actually, the Pioneer Fund has been unwavering in its support for eugenics over the years. Richard Lynn, the current head of the fund, works with the explicitly white supremacist publication American Renaissance and speaks at their conference. The white supremacist editor of American Renaissance, Jared Taylor, who viewers of my other videos will remember, is funded by the Pioneer Fund. So I don't buy Charles Murray just saying, it has changed. He doesn't give evidence for why he thinks that, and there is ample evidence against it. Anyway, it's about time to wrap this video up with a few final thoughts. But let's first briefly summarize our main counter arguments to the bell curve. Firstly, the bell curve does not prove that genetics are the primary reason for differences in intelligence. The orphans are not geneticists, they're a psychologist and a social scientist. Their estimates of the importance of genes are based on suppositions and guesses. After failing to make the case that IQ is genetic origin, they compare that IQ not to one's social background, as the back cover of the book promises, but a much more narrowly defined index of parental socioeconomic status, which includes only a few of the relevant variables. The main source of their data is more a test of academic achievement than intelligence, and since it did not return a normal bell curve distribution, Hansen and Murray manipulated the data to exaggerate what were previously much smaller differences. After a completely unnecessary section making the case